Okay, very warm welcome to another session of um, our Stockholm Plus 50 lecture series. Um, Stockholm Plus 50 because um, uh, because of the Stockholm uh, Conference on Human Environment in 1972, five decades ago. So we now have five decades of global environmental governance. Um, and uh, we would like to take stock with you um, of this period and what happened, how the environment, how environmental politics um, uh, was effective or was not effective in the time. My name is Lena Prash. I'm professor of comparative politics um, with a focus on environmental and climate politics at the Otto Zoo Institute of FU Berlin. Um, yeah, and I organized this series together with a range of students um, of whom um, you already met some. Um, so today we will hear about uh, sustainable cities and communities. Um, this is the sustainable development goal number 11. And it's a great honor for us to uh, welcome two other guests, um, this time from the University of Melbourne, um, Anna and Dan, Anna Kosovac and uh, Daniel Pejic. Before um, this time, the lecture will be split into two parts of about 20 minutes. Um, and in between, we will have time for, for some questions. Before you start, uh, Mubo, one of the students who organizes this lecture series with me, um, is going to introduce you. Um, the whole lecture will be recorded. Okay, Mubo. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, as you've already said, Lena, our two speakers today are Dr. Anna Kosovac and Mr. Daniel Page, who are both part of the Melbourne Center for Cities of the University of Melbourne. And the center focuses on the role of cities in major societal challenges, how city leadership can address them, and the information needed to do so. And doing so, they take an explicit international point of view on pressing questions for urban governance. It does so by claiming, uh, aiming to work with peers in places around the globe explicitly connecting cities, urban researchers, and key stakeholders of city leadership. Uh, Dr. Kosovac is a visiting fellow lecturer and researcher at the center, and she holds a PhD in risk perception and decision-making, a bachelor's of engineering, and a master's of international relations. Anna's expertise lies in water governance and policy, risk perceptions, decision-making, and governance. Um, Anna has worked as a civil engineer within the water industry for nine years, project managing a range of projects from planning through to construction. Her PhD research is based on how personal risk perception affects whether project managers are more or less likely to proceed with innovation projects, considering how psychological and cultural approaches to risk help explain innovation not occurring in the water sector. She has worked with various organizations, such as the Global Covenant of Mayors, UN Habitat, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the ICLEI, C40, and many more. And currently, she's working on exploring international city diplomacy, democracy, and risk perceptions, and also investigating successful observations. Our other speaker today is Mr. Danny Page. He's a PhD researcher at the Center and a research fellow in, in, in international urban migration. He holds a Master of International Relations and a Bachelor of Arts in Media and Communications from the University of Melbourne. And his research explores the role of cities in global affairs, particularly focusing on city diplomacy, cities and multilateral systems, and it sits at the intersection of international relations and urban politics. He's currently researching the role of cities as actors in global migration governance and the rescaling of politics of migration. He has held a number of, uh, of, number of professional research roles and leadership positions working to communicate and translate evidence into policy for non-profit organizations and both state and federal governments in Australia. And without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to you two and thank you very much in advance for the presentation you will give us. So where uh, uh, both Dan and I are here to discuss our chapter and a little bit more about the SDGs and um, particularly SDG 11 and how that fits within cities and both a, a case for cities and also how it fits within urban governance as well. To very first start with, uh, here in Australia, we have had a long history of uh, colonisation. And so what we tend to do here as well is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we speak from. So from here, we are both Dan and I are here on Wurundjeri country, which is the land of the Wurrung language people. 
We recognise that the land has never been ceded and as uninvited guests, we are here uh, to recognise uh, traditional owners on this land. So you've done a great um, introduction. I probably don't even need to go into introducing who I am, uh, but uh, just um, letting you know that I've uh, spent a bit of time working in the public sector, but then have also undertaken a number of projects um, within the urban space and city diplomacy, water governance um, in the environmental space as well. So, but all of these specifically looking at the urban area. Uh, so just wondering whether I'll just probably introduce Dan. Uh, you've had a bit of an introduction to Dan, but um, I will skip ahead to the actual presentation. So first of all, when we think about SDG 11, we're talking about places where essentially we have half the world's population. So over, you know, since 2007, half the world's population are in cities. Not only this, cities also contribute to 60% of the global GDP. They also account for 70% of global carbon emissions. So we're talking about places that have a substantial impact on the way that we do things globally, both uh, where people live, uh, where people work, but then also environmentally, which is something that is obviously very pertinent in terms of your own coursework and what you're doing in this space. Looking at more recent times, we're thinking about COVID-19, which really has had a very, very devastating impact on cities specifically and urban areas. Much of that due to the fact that um, it's the proximity to people, the higher dense areas that really are uh, the sites of transmission and also um, economic disruption as well as a result of COVID. So we're thinking also about um, this idea of cities being on the front line of environmental, of, uh, of economics and also of health issues. Looking more broadly as well, we're looking over time that cities and particularly in urban areas, uh, the population of, uh, or the percentage, or the proportion of people who are living in cities compared to rural areas uh, is going up. And when we talk about urbanisation, it's not just that the population of a city goes up, it's more that the proportion of people in uh, who now live in cities compared to not living in cities is going up. So having a look at this uh, map here, you can see that there has been a significant uptick in, uh, in the number of people moving to cities and that increasing urbanisation over time. And it doesn't matter where you look in the world, it is happening everywhere. More and more people are moving to cities. And so this really does then uh, link well into thinking about SDG 11. And so what I'll go into talking about is the fact that this increasing urbanisation has given a real push to get to SDG 11. I'll go through the history of uh, some of what um, has come before the Sustainable Development Goal, and we will also go into why cities and also the roles that cities can play in environmental governance too. So what do we mean when we talk about SDG 11? Well, SDG 11 essentially covers off a wide variety of areas and not surprisingly overlaps and intersects with many of the other goals too. So when we're looking at things, it looks at things like housing, upgrading slums, for example, uh, transport. So target 11.2 has a very strong transport focus. We move into other areas like as in um, looking at human settlements again, so the way that they're being planned, how they are being planned. Are they being planned by, uh, by participatory methods involving communities, for example? It's looking at the cultural and natural heritage of cities, recognising the fact that cities 
have a wide amount of uh, cultural capital that is encompassed within these places. How, what are we doing to be able to uh, ensure that these are preserved so they can be enjoyed by future generations? We do also know that disasters also uh, disproportionately affect cities too. So, and they can have uh, wide ranging uh, ramifications for cities, both in an economic sense, but also to the livelihoods of people. Then we, we're going on even further to say that, well, the target also looks at environmental impact of cities. Like I said before, 70% of greenhouse gases come directly from cities. So look at we part of looking at the global uh, way that we uh, deal with uh, environmental issues, we cannot leave cities out of this conversation. They form such a significant part of this. Then we move on to uh, looking at the way that green and public spaces are being used. Looking at a uh, national regional development planning. So it's not just, it, it looks at not just that urban area, but that slightly outside what's called the peri-urban. And then also the, the rural, how are these all being, uh, how are these connections being strengthened across these areas? And then again, we're looking at um, human settlements and you'll notice a, a common theme about human settlements coming up again and again, um, mitigation to adaptation to climate change, resilience to disasters. And lastly, looking at those buildings as well. So very, very strong focus still on uh, buildings and settlements. So, and this, this strong focus on housing, on settlements, really is a legacy from uh, a lot of the initial urban conferences that have happened within the UN. So to go back, I'm going to go back right to the 70s to start with. When we look at some of the key time points for SDG 11, we're looking at, first of all, habitat number one. And this one is the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements. This occurred in Canada in 1976. And here is a screenshot of the actual conference itself. As you can see, um, very male heavy at the time. So hopefully that that has changed since then, which... Um, in the latest rendition, which was in Habitat 3 in 2016. So this first conference really did specifically focus on issues related to human settlements. It was specifically related to urban areas, but also to, in the developing, in the developing sense is what, where they were focusing um, their attentions. So there were over 60 recommendations to come out of this conference, and this really heralded one of the first major international uh, conferences spe specifically on urban areas. And this led quite well into the formation of UN Habitat as, a, as an organisation within itself. We then also start seeing, you know, uh, a, a bit later in that piece, uh, in 1990, we skip ahead, we see the, um, the first major environmental city network, which was established in 1990. Uh, Dan will talk a little bit more about city networks uh, after my half of the presentation, so I won't go into that too much. But the fact that these, these networks being created for sustainability First one established, um, major one, in 1990. And that really did lead to uh, stronger advocacy from city networks like ICLEI to prompt that further engagement with the UN. And uh, this is uh, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Oak here speaking to uh, at the Resilient Cities Conference. And she uh, works quite a bit with ICLEI and is at our at the Melbourne Centre for Cities. We're very, very lucky to have her. One of these key spokespeople who have been uh, trying to push cities onto the world stage. Uh, 
So we had that formation of ICLEI. They're really trying to, uh, city networks like ICLEI are really trying to push those conversations further and further. Cities are important, they're saying. Why aren't cities having a, a, a seat on this global stage? And uh, this uh, led to the formation of an urban-based focus at the UN's Agenda 21. So this was at the uh, the Earth Summit in 1992. So this is the next thing that's, um, that came through. And we really did see quite a big uptick in terms of the way, um, the way that urban areas were being spoken about. This is a study that uh, that um, I did with my colleagues, so Michaela Kuto as well, uh, looking at city mentions in the, at the UN. And so we were looking at words, and it was a content analysis, looking at words like um, urban, cities, uh, local governments. How often are these places being mentioned within UN documents over time? And this is the map, which might might seem like there's a lot going on, uh, but the main ones to look out for is uh, this, first of all, the trend line right in the middle there, which is highlighting that uh, that there are increasing mentions of cities and recognition of cities over time in UN documents. But also there are a few places here, such as... Uh, uh, in this this point right here, I'm sure if you can hopefully see my cursor, but just after 1990, 1992, we see a sudden upkick in terms of the way that cities are being talked about essentially as actors. And what does this mean? This means that they're no longer spoken about as, uh, say, bystanders in the debate or as issues or as, uh, as a site for example, location, they're being talk of, talked about as actors who have some level of ability to take action on the global stage. So we're seeing that real uptick up here in, 19, in 1992, straight at, after the um, Earth Summit. And so you see, you can see how these, uh, how this does uh, change over time, but we're seeing a general uh, trend upwards in terms of the amount of uh, recognition that they're getting on the UN stage. Not too long after, 1996, we have uh, the Istanbul, um, in Istanbul we have the Istanbul Declaration which came after Habitat 2 conference and this happened in 1996 it had a very strong focus once again on housing and settlements, focusing again on the global south. It uh, talked about this idea of adequate housing and what adequate housing means. It highlighted um, there was still ongoing focus on cities in the global south, as I mentioned, but still very, very limited discussion. It talked about housing. It talked about settlements. And then there was another renewed push from a lot of city networks, other academics like uh, Susan Parnell, Professor Susan Parnell as well as a very prominent um, urban scholar, voicing concerns about this lack of broader city representation on the global stage and in frameworks. They also, which we talk a little bit about in the chapter, uh, really rec recognise the fact that a lot of the current uh, conferences happening in urban spaces specifically speak about settlements. They speak about housing, settlements, and don't and really don't talk about uh, a wider global look at the way that we uh, we see cities and the way that we plan for cities. For example, specific focuses a focus on the global south in previous frameworks, and also uh, looking at housing. So they're also saying, well. Cities actually do have more than just houses. So then came the Millennium Development Goals. So the target, they, they managed to rally for this city goal, but where did that get them? Well, 
a target specifically on cities was included. So it was under target 7D, but it was extremely limited in its scope. Once again, focusing on housing, focuses on slum settlements. So it had a very, very economic slant to it as well. It said, well, we want to, we're going to want to reduce the number of slum settlements uh, globally. And to do this, we're going to take, uh, we're asking for more public investments. So uh, the target within the goal specifically stated that the world must have achieved by 2020 a significant improvement in the lives of at least 100 million slum dwellers. So it's a very uh, clear goal in the sense of it has endpoint time, it has exact um, metrics that you can follow, but you know, in terms of an urban goal, it is still very limited in its scope, very development focused. What did it ignore? Well, like I was talking about before, cities being at the front line of all these issues, it ignored things to do with uh, anything to do with clean water, sanitation, health, education, transport, and also the climate as well. So obviously a lot of critics came out after the Millennium De Development Goals and said, hey, this target, it's, it's far too vague. This is not... This does not represent what we should be looking at when we talk about urban spaces and looking forward, especially in sustainability. As you all know, as students of this space, sustainability is much, much bigger than just uh, slums, which is, which is very, very important um, in urban areas. So they also recognise that the factors that were mentioned in here were all very spatial in nature. It talked about these sites, these locations that need to be changed. There was very limited consideration or understanding of these broader social and economic issues that are driving, for example, slum development, but also driving other issues within cities that should be addressed as well. They also, some of the, uh, especially some of the scholars and academics came out and highlighted that actually, you know what, this target can really, can really send us backwards in terms of slum eradication. It could actually promote these state-sponsored evictions of slum dwellers just so that, so that nation states could feel like they're, doing, they're taking action on this and force that eviction without actually providing any sort of alternative suitable accommodation for these people. It also just generally treated urbanisation in a way that was relatively outdated. Didn't talk about the way that people live, people's right to the city, the way that people uh, communicate, the way that they socialise in city spaces. It also, um, then they also argued that, you know, the socio-cultural concerns facing cities were therefore not being addressed by the Millennium Development Goals. So then we go to SDG 11 and there's, there's um, Susan, Professor Susan Parnell, who's back again and, and um, comes forward and uh, talks about the SDG. And the SDGs, uh, as we showed before, were much more wide ranging in scope. So we're not just looking at slum eradication, we're looking at these host of other issues as well. But not only does this apply to the global south, they've actually made it more universal so that essentially any nation state, any city could look at this and say, we can make this our own goal and we just need to provide that context for it. So Susan Parnell said in 2016 of the SDGs that SDG 11 unambiguously signals UN members' acceptance of some sort of devolution of governance, the imperative of an integrated vision of sustainable urban development, that the spatial concentration of resources and flows that cities rep represent can act as a driver of sustainable development. So recognising that these cities can play this major role. So when they were leading up to developing SDG 11, what sort of actions did they take? Well, first of all, there were multiple workshops that were run to develop these targets 
and indicators for the goal. These workshops included uh, a wide range of actors, so included the academic sphere, other local governments, uh, representative from nation states. It also included uh, business, so people from local businesses as well, and also environmental activists. So this was a wide host of people coming in for consultation to develop the targets and indicators for the goal. Like we saw before, there was a wide range of urban issues that were considered. So it wasn't just housing. Things like, like we said before, pollution, heritage, green spaces, urban planning. And then it goes into some of these other goals to do with water and sanitation, air quality, all of these elements that are, that are very much, uh, very much in cities, but a stem across a wide range of areas. Like I said, they wanted a global approach. And then finally, recognizing there was that uptick in the number of people living in urban areas. Urban spaces need its own goal, lead their own goal. And now I'm just going to hand over to you uh, and I'd love to find out from you. So hopefully there's uh, um, a few of you online that can hopefully answer this. Uh, thinking about the last couple of years, I'd love to find out from you just through a poll, a very, very quick poll. What do you think that cities governments want? And what do you think their main area of interest would be um, if you were to poll them today? So I will just cancel this share and just show you, uh, get you to log on to this. And I'm going to ask you that you pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> okay. So just bear with me for a second while I just. Okay, so if you wanted to head to this website here, I'll just um, go into presenter mode. Could you perhaps copy paste um, uh, the link into the chat, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just see. Get up to the chat and I'll do that for you right now. So the question is, and 742, there we go. What do you think is the most pertinent issue facing local government today? And more importantly, this is, I'm going to, if you want to choose one of these, and then we'll compare it to what the actual answer is. Uh, and this is based on some survey data that we had pulled up just this year. So what do you think that cities and local governments said on this issue, if they were asked? So I'll give everybody a couple of minutes just to answer this, what you think it might be. Also recognising that COVID-19 has been a major a major part of the way that we see things in the last couple of years. And also recognising the economy, a lot of people have felt uh, a lot of downturn in their economies in this time. So we'll just give everybody a few more seconds to get the last couple in. Okay. All right. Now I will show you the results oh we've got one more that just snuck in okay now we've got the results here what do you think is the most pertinent issue facing local government today so what have you what have you all said if you are all city maybe mayors sitting here um uh, many of you have said health which is probably not that surprising considering COVID 19 has been so uh, front and center of our lives for the last few years urban resilience housing and climate change. So that's been really quite interesting, especially considering when we think about um, economic development has been um, very front and centre as well. 
um, in terms of inflation rates at the moment. Uh, roads and transport, regional cooperation, not as high. But really across the board, it sounds like there's a, there's a lot of responses. So now I'll show you what city governments uh, said. And we asked, uh, it was about 60, close to 60, almost 60 cities we asked of this. And... We will show you what they said. Climate change, surprisingly. Now, I would have thought it would have been health, first and foremost, but the by and large, the largest number of cities said that they were their top issues for international engagement and uh, internationally was climate change. And this hasn't, interestingly, this hasn't changed since 2020 when we asked them. And to note that 2020 when we did ask them was um, the survey ended in actually the end of 2019. So um, it was just before the pandemic and uh, we got uh, climate change still top of the list. Interestingly, economic development has moved up more. We've had, uh, but resilience still has strong place in there. And also, funnily enough, regional cooperation. And I do wonder whether this was a COVID-19 aspect as well. So when we think about climate change in cities, well, actually, uh, not surprisingly, most city networks, and, and Dan will talk a little bit more about this in his, in his section of the presentation, but most city networks are in fact climate focused. Why is that? Well, probably not that surprising looking at those survey results we just saw. The fact that most of them are concerned about climate change first and foremost. When asked about their biggest issue, they've said climate change even during the pandemic. And why? Why should cities care so much about climate change? Well, essentially they're at the forefront of these effects. They have to deal with heat island effects. They have to deal with increasing uh, diseases as a result of climate change. Housing issues. So we're thinking about uh, many apartment or many buildings not being able to uh, be habitable in, in times of extreme weather. Green spaces. How are green spaces being utilised? So um, within climate change effects, we're seeing a lot of the fact that cities are, getting, are bearing the brunt of this. The other thing is that cities can also implement further action on climate change directly. So think about local government initiatives, the things that they do. A lot of local governments deal with waste management. That is very much a, a climate change issue in terms of the way that we recycle. They can deal with building codes. So in many places, local government can deal with building codes. They can deal with roads and transport, how they're being planned for. So uh, they have this firm hold on a lot of these issues that can directly address climate change on the ground. And especially for a lot of cities, a lack of action from national governments mean that they have a higher focus on climate change. And so um, this is an example of some of the climate change effects we do see in cities. Uh, this is uh, Sydney last week. So you may have seen that uh, we've had a significant amount of flooding here in Australia in the last six months. So all down the east coast of Australia, from Brisbane down to, down to Sydney, it has been inundated like this. Climate change has been at the forefront of many um, of these discussions, and yet we haven't had much change from the national government. And so a lot of cities are standing up and saying, hey, we need to do something about climate change because our national government isn't doing anything about it. And so we've got here, um, this is our uh, former now prime minister. We've just had an election in May. So our um, last uh, more uh, conservative government had recently been voted out and we've now got a more um, centrist left-wing government coming in. And... Uh, Scott Morrison was um, accused of failing to understand the urgency of climate change. There was a lot of um, discussion about how our, our national government was doing very, very little. 
in this space. And so what were cities saying? Well, cities instead were coming out and making a declaration in the face of the in the face of this saying well we're declaring a climate emergency we need to do something about this because our national government is not and we're the ones who have to deal with it we're the ones who have to deal with the flooding we're the ones who have to deal with uh, the heat island effects the lack of water or, or sanitation issues So, and then the cities are also, like I said, taking that direct action on the ground. And then they're also measuring this action. Well, what are they doing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? They're measuring that, household waste, water use, stormwater. And then also looking at health, uh, tree canopy, all of these areas that are well within the realm of local governments. And it all just really does... Uh, fit in extremely well with that SDG 11 goal and the fact that cities can implement these goals on the ground. And then we look a little bit more at that um, and uh, Dan will go on a little bit more about the city diplomacy and what we mean by city diplomacy, but um, these national local relations. So as we saw in this, uh, that example of Sydney and the national government, how we've said actually cities uh, maybe do not agree with a lot of what national governments do, what sort of conflict does this create? And also what, what is the relations between these two, especially when we think about actions such as action on SDG 11. So uh, we this is a survey that uh, we also did, this was this year, um, the same survey where we asked cities, uh, well, how often do you engage with national governments? We had... 39% of cities said that they contact a national government representative about the international engagement at least once a month. So that's less than half when you think about it. Climate change were the most common issues, which we spoke about earlier. And really, we've got while 70% of cities believed that they would benefit from more engagement with their national government, only 20% believe national governments should have a say in how cities conduct international affairs. So this is incredibly interesting in the fact that when we talk about SDG 11, that they, SDG 11 was really a goal for cities because cities want a seat at that global table. And these cities are coming back saying, hey, we're the ones to solve this issue and we should have a say in this. So. On that note, uh, I will pass over to Dan. So I'll just uh, cancel. Uh, hey, just give us a second. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think, uh, Lena, were you going to ask? Oh, I, I try to applause. <laughs> Thanks. Great. So um, I'm just going to go through the second part of the presentation. Um, and then, yeah, please put sort of questions in the chat as we're going. Um, and I think at the end, we'll, we'll certainly have time to address those. So um, and it's given a really good background to SDG 11 and sort of how we got here, um, the importance of it. I think what I'm going to do is take Firstly, a step back and um, look a little bit more broadly at some of the work that cities have been trying to do um, in engaging internationally. And I think uh, Anna sort of segued that quite nice with that national local relations uh, data. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to sort of come back full circle and say how this relates to SDG 11 specifically and how the performance so far has been in terms of uh, achieving SDG 11. And uh, spoiler alert, not really good. Um, Firstly, I'm just going to define a couple of concepts that uh, we that I'm going to talk about in this presentation and also we raise in the paper. Um, the first one, which Anna mentioned a couple of times, is city diplomacy, which I think is relatively um, straightforward, relatively sort of um, clear what that means. But, you know, we're, we're very aware of um, and used to national diplomats going and representing the um, the opinions and, and, and the promoting the um, sort of interests of their states internationally. Uh, what we're talking about when we talk about city diplomacy is 
um, legitimate rep representation of a uh, of a city uh, going uh, abroad or going externally and basically advocating for their their citizens. Um, and when we talk about a legitimate representative, uh, it's not always clear in an urban governance context who that is. So sometimes we're talking about mayors. Um, different countries will have different forms of urban governance. So it could be a uh, someone who's in charge of sort of a regional metropolitan area or a, or a city region, which might actually encompass a few different cities. So um, quite often there's a, there's a um, desire to sort of talk about, you know, mayors on the global stage, but actually what we're talking about is anybody who can claim to be a legitimate representative with some sort of political clout, um, who's going and then advocating, um, you know, externally to their city um, to for the interests of uh, their citizens. Oops, too far. City networks, and I spoke about a few times, and I'm going to spend most of my presentation kind of talking about um, city networking, which I think is. Uh, has been one of the most um, prevalent and I would probably say effective forms of city diplomacy. So um, I sort of see city diplomacy as being a, a higher class of activities and then city networking being one sort of tactic that cities employ. So by city networks, we're talking about uh, formal organisations. They're often member organisations, so cities form um, a membership of groups. Um, and then these uh, organisations usually have some sort of purpose. So it might be a thematic purpose. They might be focused around, you know, environment, climate, culture. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the areas from some previous research that's been done that city networks are most commonly addressing. Um, but the kind of activities that they're performing are often um, trying to exchange uh, knowledge, skills, expertise, data. Um, cities feeling like they're addressing common challenges so they can benefit from working together to try and see, you know, how is this city uh, over here addressing this challenge? What can we learn from them? But there's also uh, been a real focus on collective advocacy. And I think Anna spoke a little bit about that before. So the idea that when cities join together, particularly in large transnational groups, that we have representation of uh, sometimes, you know, a large volume of, of economic activity, um, a large volume sometimes of political capital, um, and cities are actually able to to join together and um, try to lobby towards either national governments or, or the UN and the international system and say, look, we want to say, uh, we want an influence in not just how these sort of global agenda are shaped and implemented, but actually, um, you know, at the, at the policy making end as well. The final concept, um, and thanks for bearing with me, with just a couple of definitions that um, myself and Michele Kuto have, have, have written about a few times is um, what we call global urban governance. And it's actually building on work of a few other scholars who've, who've engaged with this sort of concept as well. Uh, and global urban governance is kind of a, a two-way process. And I think Anna sort of spoke about some of the, the root causes of, of, of what we sort of argue has led us to this point. So. On the one hand, we've got what's happening in cities, um, and as a result of the increasing urbanisation and also increasing globalisation, um, city leaders or whoever's you know working to try and solve issues in urban areas, it's not always a mayor, it could be another, uh, another form of urban actor, are increasingly having to work at these different, these different sort of political scales to, to achieve the ends that they want. So a lot of people ask the question, why is our mayor, you know, why does our mayor need to go to the UN? Why does our mayor need to go abroad and advocate for our issues? You know, I'm worried about what's happening down the street. I'm worried about roads and, and garbage and things. Um, we argue that there's actually an impetus where city leaders are needing to do this because the range of challenges that they're dealing with now, which are highly globalised in nature, the kinds of challenges that, that Anna highlighted in that poll require that sort of engagement. And it's not always uh, something that city leaders are well equipped to do. So we've done some research looking at the kind of training and capacity and resourcing that, that cities and local governments have to do these activities. And it's, it's often quite scant, um, but certainly in larger cities, uh, there's this is impetus that they're having to engage at these in this multi-scalar way. The flip side of this is also that what we would call the international system, so um, or, or the multilateral system, um, which is not just sort of UN agencies, but you know we're including other sort of international actors like development banks um, and also you know international philanthropies. People are operating at this global scale, are having to become increasingly urban savvy. So they're recognizing, and this has really been a push in the last sort of 
15, 20 years, uh, a recognition that a lot of the, um, the, the, the issues that these organizations are trying to solve uh, and a lot of the solutions that they're looking for, um, uh, you know, cities are a critical, essential part of achieving that. So, uh, you know, we sort of argue there's been an urbanization of the international system in many ways. Um, there's been a real need for more urban expertise at the international level, which is which has not always been um, uh, received. <laughs> and that's why cities, I think, would advocate for a greater voice, which I'll get into later. Um, but, you know, you only kind of need to look at some of these agreements, some of the research that Anna presented to show that, um, you know, urban areas are, have really been um, central to thinking across the international system over the last few years. Some some, some colleagues, um, uh, this work was led by Michele Kuto at the, at the Melbourne Centre for Cities with some, some other colleagues um, a few years ago did some research looking at kind of the, the global ecosystem of city networks. So as Anna mentioned, there's been a, a real proliferation of them, particularly sort of after the, um, you know, in the early 90s, after the Rio Earth Summit, there's been a, a number of environmentally focused networks which um, were established around that time. But the other point of this chart is that um, city networking as a concept, as, as an activity, actually has a really long history. And if we look all the way back to the 19th century, we're, we're seeing more domestically focused um, networks pr predominantly. So, so um, you know, networks of cities operating within a, a country who might be joining together to try and solve solutions or, or advocate to, 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 to national or other levels of government. Um, but certainly we've seen an increase in the number of city networks recently uh, and also the um, particularly transnational city networks, the so city networks of uh, groups of cities that are operating across more than one, um, one state. And this research looked a little bit at what kind of issues that these city networks were focusing on and also some of the challenges they were potentially confronting. So this is a few years old now and I would, uh, one of my sort of jobs that I'm going to get around to later in the year is to do some, some extra research following up on this sort of ecosystem of city networking and I'm anticipating there's going to be some major changes as a result of COVID. But back pre-COVID when this particular piece of research was done, um, you know, th this large number of city networks was uh, encouraging in the sense that the activity uh, has been great, but also came as a as a cost was sort of the conclusion. So a number of the city networks, you know, around a quarter were uh, experiencing some sort of budgetary challenges. Um, there's a heavy reliance in terms of funding on multilateral structures. So many of these networks were sort of funded by um, organizations that exist in the multilateral system, um, which also creates some interesting power dynamics when we talk about these organizations trying to then advocate to that system to, to, to change the structures and change the way that consultation takes place. Um, also, the EU uh, has been a, was a really major funder and has been a really major funder in um, particularly time limited um, networks uh, and, and European cities are perhaps the most engaged in terms of city networking and city diplomacy activities. Um, uh, I'll actually present some data a little bit later, uh, specifically about Europe. Um, but over the right hand side, you can see um, the reason why uh, city networking and city diplomacy has, we think, a really logical home and why we spend so much time talking about it in our SDG 11 chapter is the fact that so many of these networks uh, have traditionally have been environmentally focused. And also, some of these networks have gone to take, um, you know, a relatively, um, perhaps too, too far to say central, but certainly a really active and I would say effective role uh, in trying to influence global environmental governance. Um, some of the, the larger networks that we see now, which are um, in sometimes you know, heavily funded by US philanthropic organizations, um, are now, you know, bringing together, you know, we, we speak in our chapter about some of these organizations, you know, bringing together 10,000 cities, for instance. Um, you know, there is direct institutional linkages now between a number of these networks and, uh, for instance, COP or between, you know, other UN processes where city networks have a, have a seat at the table. Um, you know, they're definitely not driving the, the bus in terms of, uh, you know, the, the interstate system. Uh, certainly it's still being uh, run by states um, and these cities are playing a subsidiary role, but certainly more than ever they're, um, uh, you know, having their voices heard and having a, a, a potential to try and influence the discussions that are happening um, in, in the multilateral system. And this research, which is actually, um, Anna presented one of the charts from this research, and I'll just sort of go into a little bit of detail for, for a couple of points that I think are relevant, but um, this research basically showed that. So we looked at a range of um, UN frameworks that were underpinning Agenda 
2030, but sort of looking back at some of the formative frameworks as well, um, and found that 80% um, of, of acknowledgements of cities um, had occurred since the year 2000. Over time, there was an increasing recognition and acknowledgement that cities have an important role to play in sustainable development um, across a whole range of different areas. Um, apologies for the black and white here. This is straight from a paper. But um, Anna mentioned that the, this idea that cities are not just sites where things happen. So, for instance, on the left hand side there, you can see uh, an example of a, a recognition of a city as a site would be something like the Montreal Protocol, you know, a, a, a place where something happened. Uh, an example of a, a, an acknowledgement of a city uh, in a UN framework that would be an issue would be, for instance, if you were talking about you know, urban inequality as, as an issue. Um, but the, the highest or most commonly uh, most common way that cities were acknowledged in these frameworks was actually as actors, so with some capacity to influence the achievement of global goals. Um, and on the right hand side there you can see this is across a whole range of areas, so d d development obviously being a really key one and pertinent to the sustainable development goals, but um, you know, thinking back to all of those indicators that Anna raised early in SDG 11, uh, we certainly see a lot of those in terms of um, you know, cities playing a, uh, an important role and, and um, certainly to some extent being recognised as actors, um, you know, with, with some agency uh, toward meeting those goals. So one major way uh, that cities have been trying to uh, directly address uh, the SDGs is through uh, what we call voluntary local reviews, which um, some of you may have heard of before. I'm sure most of you have heard of voluntary national reviews. So voluntary national reviews, obviously being, you know, the uh, nation states having a, a, an expectation that they would report on their um, that their progress towards meeting Agenda 2030. Um, you know, we, we obviously know that not all states have necessarily done that or done that with the frequency that uh, we would like to see. Um, but a range of local governments, um, and this is probably a little bit outdated, there's probably more now, um, around the world have taken it on themselves to um, undertake what we call voluntary local reviews. So that's uh, city governments, local governments, it could be a, a different entity undertaking it. There's a few different examples. Um, basically localizing the, the SDGs to their context um, and then saying, well, you know, what targets can we set ourselves? What role can we play in actually working towards the achievement of these goals? Um, sometimes that localization process um, is is quite uh, intensive in that maybe the, the the end product of what they're committing to looks a little bit different than what the sustainable development goals um, started as, um, and sometimes cities will take the um, the approach of uh, focusing on a subset of goals. So obviously, urban governance is an extremely um, extremely varied uh, concept across countries. Um, you know, you would know from, you know, even just the own, your own places from, that you're from, um, you know, in different contexts, local governments or different levels of government will have very different powers, jurisdictional authority and legal authority. Um, so depending on, um, you know, what context, uh, what powers local governments have, they might say, well, look, you know, we're going to focus on this subset of SDGs because we think that we can have a real impact on them. We're going to leave these other ones because it is the provincial government, the local state government, or, you know, the national government that has most of a say over that, and we have very little influence. But I would say that um, the, the, the movement towards VLRs, and, and, we, and we should mention that, you know, I should be very clear on the fact that even if we say, you know, more than 125 local governments, in, the, in terms of the number of cities globally, that's still a very small number. So we're still talking about a group of, um, you know, leading cities who are highly engaged internationally um, already. But what it singles, I think, from an SDG leadership perspective uh, is a couple of things. One is, as Anna mentioned, sometimes um, these cities are performing these activities uh, in within states that have not been particularly committed to achieving the SDGs. Um, the US is a, is, a, is a prominent example, I think, of some cities in the US um, that have completed VLRs and, and before you know the US has completed the national review. Um, but also we've got a, quite a bit of commitment, as you can see, from across the global north and south. So it hasn't just been a global north story in terms of the cities that are um, completing these reviews. The other thing that it gives us, which I think is very valuable, is, is data, is city level data. So one of the real challenges of um, tracking the way that SDGs are going in cities. We know that cities are, if you believe this, you, that cities are, are playing an essential role and have an essential role to play in meeting Agenda 2030. But a lot of the time, particularly in the global south, there is very low quality or no data available to see how we're tracking against these particular indicators. Um, in, in many countries, national level data is just sort of applied to cities. Um, uh, probably some of you are aware of sort of comparative 
city rankings, things like the, the livability indexes and things. There's a there's a whole range of these global city rankings, which um, I've done some research on. And and as you dig into these, you find that quite often um, places are using you know national level data if they don't have quality uh, local level data. So it's producing data, it's understanding what the local context is looking like, and it's also allowing cities to learn from others and take innovation and inspiration from other cities in terms of the way that they can um, address, tailor, and adapt um, particular SDG targets. So um, very briefly, this was uh, research from or, or data from the uh, the survey of uh, around 60 um, uh, sort of larger cities that uh, Anna mentioned earlier. So um, I just found this interesting. The reason why I've separated it is in this sample, we had a large number of European cities um, and I actually found it interesting that if we asked them uh, how many were using the SDGs in their sort of regular reporting that they're doing, their planning and reporting, um, the majority were, uh, but around two thirds of European cities were, but uh, even more, four out of five uh, cities outside of Europe um, said that they were using the SDGs in their, in their, in their reporting. Um, and on the right hand side there, you can see that um, outside of Europe, uh, almost half of cities said that, that the process of localizing global agenda was one that they found really impactful on their on their city planning and, and, and governance. Um, and only around a quarter of European cities said that was the case. Um, I'm not quite sure potentially, um, you know, because um, there is so much collaboration and work within the EU that cities are doing. And I was saying there's a lot of networks that are um, EU focused. Uh, that potentially could be the reason why that's lower. But I did find that interesting because um, this wasn't just talking about the SDGs. That was probably the most prominent example. But there were certainly other international um, agreements that cities said that they were uh, localizing for their own context. So the last couple of slides, I just want to quickly touch on, I won't go through every indicator, but um, I think we should talk about how we're progressing toward um, meeting um, SDG 11, considering we don't have so long to go now. Uh, and the answer is um, not great. Uh, but in general, I would say that um, the level of data and the level of um, sort of the, the, the metrics that we have on most of the indicators is actually quite poor. So there's lots of areas in the world where we really can't be that confident about the data that we, um, that we have. Um, particularly in the global south. But if we look just generally at this map, you can see obviously red, orange, yellow is not particularly good and not on track to meet the goal. This is across all of the, the indicators of SDG 11. Um, lots of work to be done. And certainly the pandemic has um, uh, created some really negative impacts on progress towards a lot of these indicators, um, but also uh, many of them were not particularly tracking towards being met prior um, as well. A couple of indicators I'll just draw out because they're ones that I guess have been mentioned previously. So the, the, the proportion of urban population that's living in slums, you can see on the left hand side there, this is from the 2022 um, report on, on um, sustainable development report. You can see a massive divide between the global north and south, um, which is perhaps not surprising considering we're talking about you know slums and informal settlements. Um, but all kinds of work to do in terms of um, the, the proportion of people living in slums uh, and slum upgrading. Um, a few years ago, basically there, there was a, a decrease uh, globally um, in, in the proportion of people who were a slight decrease um, in the proportion of people who were living in slums um, kind of over the, in the mid sort of two, uh, mid 2010s. And then between 2014 and 2018, this actually regressed back um, I could only guess that um, it would potentially be a, a worse situation that we're looking at now after COVID. And we certainly have evidence that the pandemic has really worsened the plight of, um, of people who are living in slums. There were some goals, uh, as Anna mentioned, some indicators around um, the, the proportion of our urban spaces that are, um, that are you know, open public spaces and, and, and streets. Um, and, and this is another goal where, you know, the, the, we're generally tracking far behind where we sort of wanted to be. Um, there's a few goals around urban planning specifically, which related to sort of national urban plans and other things, but, um, you know, in general, sort of, a, you know, not, not where we want to be um, in 2022. And finally, the, the final one I want to touch on was access to public transport. Um, and, and currently only around half the world's, this is you know, data from 2019, so even a few years old, but only around half the world's um, urban population have, have access to public transport by the measures used in the indicator. So um, lots more work to do in public transport, which has uh, enormous implications, obviously, for sustainable development, city planning generally. Um, so that is the end of the presentation. Um, the final thought that sort of Anna's put here is a, is a um, 
something that's sometimes taken as a truism for people who work on on cities um, internationally. Uh, it's never quite clear who originally sort of said this quote. It's sometimes attributed to, to Michael Bloomberg, sometimes to other people. But uh, the way that cities, I guess, have been advocating um, and sort of selling their message of, of impact over the last um, particularly 20 years or so has been this idea that they are the people, they are the, uh, the political unit that is going to solve this crisis. Um, you know, they are the political unit that has the, um, the capacities and the will and the, and, and the, the drive to actually um, create a more sustainable future. Um, you know, I think we can unpack that critically about whether that's true, but um, certainly I think that that's, there's been a, an expectation or, or a sort of um, division set up between nation states, which is seen as sort of locked in the quagmire of international politics and, um, and not able to be um, innovative and dynamic in the way that they're addressing a lot of these challenges, um, and cities which are sort of say that they're out on the forefront in doing so. Uh, so they would argue that they're important to not just SDG 11, but really across the, the, the gamut of the SDGs. I think that is it. Um, so I will stop sharing and I will invite Anna to slide back over um, for any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, if you feel free to raise your hand in the chat, I will name your name and you can go ahead with the question. And also for the people in the live stream, please just um, put it into the live stream chat room and we will be able and then to um, get the question to Anna and Dan. Thank you. Um, I have a question concerning um, the the inequalities between Global North and Global South, because, um, yeah, I wonder if if working on the city level or in collaborating on the city level would help to overcome these divides, or would you say that we maybe see the same imbalances so that globalized cities from the Global North dominate the city networks and the debates? So maybe you can describe the dynamics you see in those networks. Thank you. I can, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll start on that one. Um, good question. And I think there's kind of two parts to it that I'll tease out. So I'll start with the second part, which was around the network specifically. Um, so I think we talk a little bit in our chapter from memory around the fact that I think a lot of the, certainly the original drive um, for city networking and the sort of cities that were most um, active were predominantly from the global north. There, there are exceptions to that um, that rule, but that it sort of has generally been the case. If you look at SDGs specifically, um, things like the voluntary local review were kind of driven from um, initially you know, New York City combined, in collaboration with some Japanese municipalities. And you know, there were a lot of global north cities who were kind of dominating that discussion. Um, a lot of the time in city networks, you might have a really large number of cities, but then sort of a, a core group of, you know, executive cities who are actually kind of, you know, driving the bus in terms of uh, the priority areas that that network focuses on. And um, traditionally, a lot of those have been in the global north. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, obviously, just resourcing is a big one. So most um, cities in the global south um, don't have particularly extensive resources to do this kind of international work, uh, even cities in the global north, and we've done some research on this, uh, generally don't have really extensive sort of international teams. They might have a director of international relations and a few people who are working in an office. Um, they might also have people in other parts of the city government who are engaging internationally. Um, but uh, even if we look more just sort of locally, I guess, uh, it, it's become very prominent that local governments will have, um, or very common that local governments will have sort of a sustainability team um, or a group that's potentially in the planning office that's working across cities and are trying to attend to and, um, you know, address a range of different sustainable um, goals. But once again, um, you know, we're talking about large city governments that have the resourcing to um, to do those kind of activities. In a lot of cities in the world, and I would say most cities in the world, um, you know, there are much more um, you know, potentially like immediate or concerns that cities feel like they need to be addressing just from a resource perspective. Um, but in the network story, I think that it is starting to change in that um, the networks are becoming more globally representative. We have a little bit of data on this as well. Um, certainly in the leadership structures, I think it's been more, much more uh, greater focus, particularly over the last decade or so, in trying to include more cities from the global south um, into the leadership structures of these organisations. Um, and also that's really important for the for agenda setting of the networks. Because I guess one of the early criticisms of, of networks is a lot of the issues that they were um, purporting to um, address and the way that they were framing those issues was really from a, a global north perspective. Um, 
not always with as much relevance for cities in the global south. The power, I think, of the SDGs, <coughs> excuse me, um, has been as kind of a, you know, a coalescing force as being sort of they're broad enough that cities um, across the global north and south can can um, get on board and try to commit to those those um, those broad targets. But once again, as, it, as I mentioned, sort of the the process of adaptation and localization can be a really challenging one. Um, and cities in the global south are sometimes left with, um, you know, limited areas where they feel like they can have a, a significant impact. So I would say, look, it, it, it depends and we certainly see examples from a lot of large cities in the global south that are doing really innovative work, sometimes in, uh, in states where the national governments have been very ineffective, um, not just in this area, but just in, in governance in general. Um, we also see examples of some cities in the global south that have had uh, or, or leaders that have had sort of political turmoil thrust upon them because of their efforts to try and sort of, um, you know, undermine or the national government feeling like they're undermining them in, in terms of their international engagement and the work that they're doing. So um, long answer, but I would say there is potential. Um, you know, right now in terms of meeting Agenda 2030, obviously we, we need all the help we can get. So I think having cities in the global south actively engaged um, in these issues and, and working towards them and providing examples for other cities has been uh, hugely, I think, impactful and important. Um, but there are enormous resource constraints and there's still a reality where, um, you know, cities of the global north, I think, are benefiting more from, from these types of activities sometimes than their, their, their counterparts in the south. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, that was very thorough. <laughs> So thank you for the interesting lecture, first of all. Um, I would like to know how you see the relation between gentrification and sustainable cities. So can there be sustainable cities and also sustainable housing without slum clearance or yeah, without gentrification uh, happening? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a housing expert by any means. So um that would probably have to be a, a question that I would probably ask some of our urban housing scholars within our faculty because, um, yeah, having a look at that kind of uh, going well, gentrification and also sustainable development, um, that that line there is a huge area of scholarly literature that um, I'm not an expert in, so I'm probably not the best person to to ask, but really, really good question. Yeah, look, I think uh, once again, yeah, housing is not sort of a, a real um, focus area of my work either. But um, I think that um, certainly there are a lot of, uh, with the increasing urbanisation that, that um, Anna was speaking of, and, and even just like looking at reflecting on our context here in Melbourne and a lot of other um, admittedly global north contexts where we've seen enormous price rises in recent times in terms of um, how access to housing. We have just an exploding, ridiculous housing market here in Australia, and I know that's replicated in many other parts of the world, um, which is creating, you know, significant challenges. Um, we also here in Australia, and, and I think this is the case in a lot of other places as well, have enormous sort of wastage of accommodation. So um, some, some the recent um, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics report, which is our sort of government body that does um, statistical work here, estimated that we have about a million houses here in Australia that are um, uninhabited. At the moment, so we have you know enormous property speculation and investment here in Australia. Um, it is highly you know unsustainable to be building cities where you have um, you know, individuals that are own, that are owning you know large pro property portfolios and um, you know not making that housing available for people to live in. Um, I think the issue of slum clearance is is, a, is another one that probably we're not fully equipped to talk about. But I think it was an interesting point that that Anna raised regarding the Millennium Development Goals that. Um, you know, you don't want to create perverse incentives in, in the way that you try and um, address, uh, you know, the number of people who are living in, in slums or living in formal settlements. Um, you know, we need to be getting to the heart of, of those challenges rather than necessarily sort of just saying we just need to decrease this without thinking about the, uh, the mechanisms through which that's going to happen. Mm. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I was wondering in this, in the connection a little bit also um, continuing Laura's question. Um, there is uh, like a group of cities in the world that are called, uh, that yeah can be categorized as mega cities. So that means a huge uh, mega uh, <laughs> areas uh, uh, which have all of these problems in a much more tighter um, 
concentration, everything you, you were talking about. Um, and also this, um, well, you can al almost see a trend of uh, some of these mega cities of the go national governments moving the national capitals like Cairo or Jakarta to like um, non-developed non, non areas where they, they try to solve these problems by just removing the city, um, yeah, to uh, replacing it to, to another spot. And I was just wondering um, if you have, you know, some in your research, if you see some um yeah trends or uh, specific um uh, developments that concerns this this kind of like mega city problem um in this in the context of uh, sdgs or also like a global representation if they can you know if there's anything specific like for example some specific network of this uh, cities or yeah anything yeah of um of the kind um to solve this kind of uh, mega problem <laughs> Start you can start and then yeah i'll jump in um yeah so that's that's a really really good point and the fact that we do have these mega cities popping up and it is becoming a massive sustainable issue for you know for example water infrastructure and it's as somebody who i used to be uh work in water planning and dealing with all of these um, new population of people, how do we start getting the water? Uh, how do we start you know, dealing with wastewater issues, uh, sanitation, stormwater? You know, the, the, the case of, you know, Sydney as well, where we start getting um, non-porous services, for example, in cities. And then the fact that we can't get it, we get a lot of water flow causing floods. So a lot of these mega cities are starting or have probably seen for a while now a lot of these issues and the issues are actually just compacting one on top of each other. And so we're seeing uh, uh, issues to do with not only infrastructure, people getting access to uh, transport, their basic services, but then also things like housing as well. So we're seeing that increasing gentrification as you've already uh, touched on and also increasing uh property prices but then we also think about well why do people move to cities people move to cities most often for their uh, economic opportunities and that has been something that we've seen has been a trend uh, like that graph that I showed you ever since the 50s people have been moving to these cities and being attracted to especially mega cities like um, that you know that we do see like Tokyo uh, being attracted to these big places because they are economic powerhouses and they are seen as a, a vast amount of opportunity and what we do know is that people who live in cities tend to earn more than people who live outside of cities. So this says a lot about that attraction of cities to places, and especially cities as being this sort of cultural hubs as well, hubs of activity, that people feel like that they can uh, find their, you know, their people or, you know, their their quite often quite multicultural as well and they have a lot of arts and a lot of these added elements that really make cities places to be but then that like you said brings a lot of the uh, sustainability issues attached to it but one thing I will add though is that in terms of helping sustainability higher density is actually not a bad thing in terms of when we think about how infrastructure is being pulled through or uh, how we, we can actually just get everybody in one place and then be able to, um, you know, service people uh, more sustainably than if people were far more spread out. In the case of Melbourne, we have had a city that has had um, a huge urban sprawl and that has had its own sustainability issues in terms of the fact that we don't have adequate transport for places further out. Uh, quite often um, services are a lot harder to get to these places, more expensive uh, and also they don't really have those sort of um, uh, not not have accessibility to green spaces or to uh, to shops or places that people need as well. So it's it's really an ongoing issue that um, that I, I think is is further being addressed by things like city networks and that. So I'll let Dan speak to. Yeah, look, I'll just say a couple of brief things. So um, firstly, I mean, I think 
I don't have the statistic at hand, but I think I remember some um, some work being done. I think it was last year where they were basically saying now I think it's the majority of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are actually I think are being emitted from about twenty five cities globally. So it's actually an even smaller subset of cities. And and when we think about you know mega cities, particularly the sort of mega cities we're thinking of in in, in Asia, South Asia, China, et cetera, you know, we're just talking about enormous urban agglomerations that are that are housing um you know the, the the kinds of numbers of people that we would previously only associate with sort of states you know one thing i would say from the networking space is that we haven't seen and i've, I've done some writing on this a lot of um recognition of um the very sort of different contexts that things like mega cities are dealing with compared to smaller cities um and one of the criticisms i guess of networks has been that they're sometimes you know a coalition of the willing so it's like if you're a if you're a city that, that wants to be involved in this and, 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 you know, has a desire to achieve certain goals or participate, you'll sort of can, can be included. Um, there are some examples where that's not the case. So, for instance, C40 cities, which is one of the most prominent um, groups looking at mitigating the impacts of climate change. They have around 100 cities globally. You need to be a certain size. So you sort of need to apply and say we're a certain size to um, to to uh, be part of that group. That being said, um, you know, to use an example of, here in Australia, we have uh, in our large cities like Melbourne and Sydney, we actually have a really um, sort of a, a system of local government where it's actually broken down into lots of individual small local government units. It's actually a really pluralized system of governance. So within C40 cities, which is supposed to be sort of the, the hundred largest cities in the world, um, the city of Melbourne plays a role. The city of Melbourne is actually, um, we live in it, it's actually a tiny jurisdiction of about 180,000 people that really doesn't have very much power to do anything over the the, the broader urban population of, of, you know, almost 5 million who live here. So I think there's a disproportionate, uh, in terms of the the, the impacts that, um, the, the challenges that megacities face, but also, as Anna was saying, from a planning perspective, the impacts that they can have on sustainable development, there's, a, there's enormous opportunities when you get, you know, that number of people together um, to create a more sustainable way of living. Um, but certainly in areas, uh, you know, a range of areas in the world, um, you know, particularly in the global south where there are mega cities, you know, that we're not always seeing that the case. Now, I think there could be an opportunity from a networking perspective to actually um, have groups that delineate out, you know, here is the core, you know, here are these 25 cities that really matter for, for, for what's happening. Because, um, you know, we see that at the national level in terms of SDGs as well. Um, you know, we see fantastic performance and it can be exciting from a leadership perspective to look at Scandinavian countries or, you know, other countries and small countries in the world that are doing innovative things and working towards goals. Um, but when we're talking about having an impact on a global scale, um, sometimes looking at those, you know, nation states or cities that are really the ones that are, you know, emitting the most greenhouse gases, um, we know where we can have the most impact. I, I think there is potential to have, you know, a more sort of targeted focus on some of those, um, some of those megacities. You indicated how city networks are growing and how they are also becoming more representative and legitimate. Would you say that this is something that national governments feel challenged by? Um, or do they, on the contrary, probably assist with resources, for example, because um, they feel that cities can, in some areas, be more effective than the national governments? Um, yeah, really good question. I'm actually doing uh, done some work on this recently and continuing to do some work on this with some some colleagues in the US and a few other places. So um, one of the, the the bits of work that um, we've done is sort of talking to a range of people from both city governments and also from um, the foreign affairs offices of national governments and talking about the, the way that those relationships actually sort of function. Um, and, and some of the, the data that I presented, I think, speaks to that, that sort of central local relations. Um, to characterize it really briefly, I think until um, relatively recently, um, there's been a really low level of understanding um, in a lot of national governments about what cities are doing internationally. So um, they, they, I think national governments probably have a good sense and sometimes have multi-level structures through which they're, they're engaging with their local governments and they sort of know what they're doing within their, their, their country. Um, but I think there's been much less recognition or understanding of, of um, these sort of new international um, engagements that are going on. That is, I think, starting to change uh, a little bit. So we've seen some examples, a um, couple of recent examples in the US at the moment. There's a, there's a bill that they're trying to work through Congress called the City and State Diplomacy Act. Um, the idea is that they would set up a, uh, an off, a dedicated office in the State Department in the US that would be have the role of engaging with not just cities, governments, but also state governments. Um, and trying to work in a more sort of multi-level 
um, approach to foreign policy. Uh, in Australia, we had a very different sort of approach where our previous government passed legislation that um, any sort of subnational entity, so that could be local states, it could be um, local governments, even public universities, um, are not allowed to create any uh, arrangements with foreign entities unless they are approved by the national government. So much more a sort of coercive um, approach. Um, a piece of work that I've been doing over the last sort of year or so um, has been, um, you know, convening a few roundtables where we've been talking to, to city and, and national representatives about this. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very different sort of approach. So some of them, um, you know, foreign officers will have a, a, a group, um, you know, will have an office or something that engages with cities. Um, you know, sometimes that might be in a different arm of government or cities are just working across, you know, various departments of a national government. Um, but the general sense is I don't think that national governments yet, apart from Australia and a few other examples, necessarily see a threat in what cities doing. Uh, I think, but I also don't think they understand the scale of what cities are doing. Um, as the prominence continues, um, as you know, cities are, are doing more of this, becoming more, and the networks are becoming sort of more prominent, more engaged in these processes. I wouldn't be surprised in what kind of what we're predicting is that national governments are going to start to, to pay more attention to this, and that could be through supporting it, trying to harness it, which I think is the intent of that US legislation, or it could be controlling it, um, saying, you know, we see this as a threat to our, um, you know, our position as, as the essential foreign policy actors. And, and what we really want to do is just get our cities in line. What are they, why are they going to the UN? Yeah, yeah, but also, yeah probably, probably the other one is that um, sometimes that tension can work in like can sometimes uh, work in the city's face. Like the example of, say, Taipei is an example of a city which, as Taiwan, can't probably can't do as much uh, in terms of international work, whereas as Taipei, as a city, um, kind of subverts a lot of those those national uh, interesting and, and, the, and the conflict um, with, that we do see with with China, if they were to go out as as Taiwan, they go out as Taipei. It's a very very different um, a different message putting across as the city, and I do wonder how much of it is that many nation states don't feel that, or perhaps feel that uh, cities are still almost like seen as lesser than. Would you agree with that? Like kind of Yeah, maybe this... not a, not not a effective enough to worry about or not impactful enough. To like worry they about. they quite often, you know, think of, you know, cities are still uh places where oh they deal with the garbage. You know, they deal with waste management and the, and the smaller issues that we don't have to deal with. But actually, in the background, there's all of this um, international engagement activities going on. Uh, things like sister cities is a good example of that. Um, the, the whole sister cities programs between two different cities around the world um, and how that helps you know, to uh, uh, nation states relations actually as well um, as tourism to the city and all of these added benefits for both um, both states. Um, but in addition to that, um, there will always be a little bit of a, a harder, I think, track for cities to feel uh, their international engagement activities are being accepted by their own constituents. So, and this will always be a um, a barrier for cities engaging more. And so I believe that because a lot of constituents still see, or when I talk about constituents, uh, citizens of that city um, might, might question why uh, an international office exists in their city, or they might question, why are you doing so many international trips to the UN? And uh, so that level of understanding is still um so there's still not that acceptance in place meaning cities are less likely to spend money on international travel and that meaning they they're probably still not at the stage where they would usurp control um over nation states at this stage mm. 
just super briefly, um, uh, I agree with that. They're obviously not going to. Um, but just relating to the question on mega cities and the, and that question, I think certainly I think COVID nineteen and the move of a lot of engagement to to virtual spaces um, has created more opportunities for for cities to do this kind of work, um, and also for urbanisation in general. So I think your question about you know your question around mega cities and and, and urbanisation in general, I think we're seeing real shifts in the way that cities are going to be. Um, lived in in the future just because of the uh, the capabilities for remote work that we have in um, in a lot of areas. Great. Um, keeping time in mind, we would maybe, if there are more questions, collect them and then just ask them all together so that we are, yeah, like Anna and Dan don't have to stay here for too long because it's already quite late in Melbourne at this point. Yeah, Martin, please go ahead. Um, I have a question regarding accountability because, I mean, the agenda was basically agreed upon by, na <clears throat> by nation states. And then you mentioned the um, huge lack of data also when it comes to network activities and city activities. So I was wondering if there's still a way to also hold, hold um, cities accountable for their sustainable or, or non-sustainable activities. Uh, I can go first and then yep. jump to you. Um, yeah, I, look, I think there's been some interesting examples of um, cities kind of setting up their own accountability mechanisms. So my, the first one I'd raise is you're absolutely right in that it's very easy for um, for cities to look at something like the SDGs and say, well, this is, uh, you know, a, a, an agenda that has been um, agreed to, you know, by, by states. Um, you know, it's great if cities can be on board with it, um, but they also have you know, no accountability. They don't need to do, you know, these voluntary local reviews. Um, it, it, it's sort of a nice to have, I guess. But the way that some cities have, have kind of addressed this challenge, um, particularly, again, an example is the city of Bristol in the UK, which is a very internationally engaged city and sort of a, a leader in some of these areas. Um, they went through a pretty extensive process to try and um, build their overall city strategy and plan kind of around the, um, the SDGs. Um, and some really interesting sort of scholarly work looking at the way that they did that and the processes that it went through. Um, and they wanted to engage a really broad um, group of stakeholders from their city together to try and um, you know, go through that process and to set up sort of some collective accountability for the fact that, you know, everybody's um, more or less, you know, agreeing with these goals. And, and, and some of the people who are involved in this work have sort of said that, I guess, the power of the SDGs, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, was as this organising sort of coalescing force, whether it's local government or, or business or other stakeholders, they felt like they could get them all on board with this idea. You know, people like the SDGs. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to be against the idea of Agenda 2030, right? When the rubber hits the road and you work out how you're going to achieve those targets, who wins and who loses, that's, that's the challenging part. So um, I think kind of participatory planning models where um, you have structures that are set up, um, you know, and the SDGs are closely aligned or embedded to that. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that a large number of cities are using SDGs in their reporting is one part of it. At the same time, you know, you could argue that that's sort of a, a faux, you know, a fake form of accountability in a sense, because if they don't meet those goals, um, you know, chances are citizens are not coming back to them and saying, you know, you didn't make, SGG, you know, 11. Um, but uh, I think that, um, you know, those sort of planning models uh, being cognizant front of mind and working in a way that, um, you know, embeds the SDGs across local government structures and brings some of these other urban stakeholders well is, is one of the better ideas that I have seen for, for increasing accountability. They're also accountable to their, I mean, I would argue to constituents as well. Um, so even though they might not have been there at the frameworks and, um, you know, they aren't nation states that are, you know, um, signing up for this process, they nevertheless do uh, capture this within all their planning and therefore once they announce it, they're accountable to their constituents who would then uh, expect that these um, SDGs are followed through with and that they're say, being tracked in some sort of way. The other way is that there is a there is starting to be a bit more of an international community who are starting to track these, these elements. So things like within city networks, seeing what cities have been doing, and they start to track each other so they can learn off one another. 
as well. So rather than uh, rather than doing it on a um, at the UN level where it would be nation states before, suddenly now the cities are coming forward and actually getting this happening through their own networks. So being able to pull each other up as needed. And we haven't just on that really briefly. We haven't actually seen this in practice, but some city networks have entertained the idea of having some sort of like coercive or kind of, you know, punitive results for, for not achieving. Um, so, you know, generally these are just member-based organisations, but the ones that are more prestigious that people really want to be involved in, um, there has been ideas floated, not really operationalised at this stage, about the way that cities could be, yeah, collectively hold each other account through these networks and have some kind of, um, you know, negative outcomes if they're not um, performing to, to um, you know, the, the, the targets that they've set. Thank you so much. Um, thank you also, Miro, for moderating. I think we've come to an end, um, to the end of this session, at least. Um, it was so interesting to hear about the role of cities in global environmental governance. And it's good to see that cities at least started talking about climate change and other environmental issues. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I think we can give you another virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thanks, Mira and Lena, and thanks for all the, the questions as well. Yeah, really okay, great maybe um, we have this tradition now <laughs> that we always take a screenshot with everybody. So please, um, I think the recording is um, off now, I hope. <laughs> um, and please, everybody, can you turn on your camera and then we have a screenshot? Um, Lara, do you want to take it or shall <laughs> Lara with the mask in the train? <laughs> yeah, I'm in, in, in the train, so I would prefer you taking it. Because... Okay, then I take it. Thank okay. you. One, two, three. Okay, I did. <laughs> Thanks so much. And we stay in touch, okay, Ananda? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, nice. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.